2021 Master Pediatrician, Dr. John Van Cherry. I now have the honor of introducing your um, other Master Pediatrician today, Dr. John Van Cherry. Uh, Paul Cooper did uh, nominate John, but asked that I represent him um, and introduce John, So, and I am uh, honored to do so. I think you're all very familiar with the term triple threat in academic medicine. Uh, triple threats perform a quality original research, achieve excellence in teaching uh, students and residents, and provide high quality clinical care. Well, with John, we don't have a triple threat, we actually have a quadruple threat. Because in addition to his many achievements in these three classic academic areas, which easily qualify him as a master pediatrician, he's also uh, demonstrated himself to be a passionate, dedicated, and, and a successful leader. John has influenced and guided improvements in the lives of children and the providers who care for them within this state and in some areas around the country. And in fact, because of his achievements in these 14 years that he's been back in the state of Louisiana, John is the only uh, recipient of the Buzzy Van Cherry Award who has received it twice. The Buzzy Van Cherry Award was named after John's father and it recognizes someone who makes a special effort to improve the health of children by increasing their access to care. And John really has done that uh, with remarkable amount of leadership commitment and work throughout this state. So briefly, like Ray, I'm gonna give a little background for, of John. John grew up in Lake Charles, graduated from Tulane University, completed an MD and PhD training at Emory and then general pediatric training followed by a uh, pediatric infectious disease fellowship with postdoctoral training in molecular virology at Baylor Texas Children's Hospital. After five years on the faculty at Baylor, I was able to recruit John back to Louisiana, not an easy task, uh, uh, but um, he agreed to come to serve as chief of pediatric infectious diseases at LSU Shreveport. He quickly established himself as the go-to person in the department to get things done in the laboratory. Within a few years, I named him vice chair for pediatric research. I shortly thereafter named him as director of the Children's Clinical Research Center. He rapidly rose to the rank of professor. John has participated in a myriad of clinical trials of antimicrobials and vaccines. He led our participation in the NIH funded collaborative antiviral study group. In addition, John has maintained a funded productive basic science uh, research laboratory through which many masters, PhD candidates and medical students have worked. His primate research has led him to have an adjunct faculty appointment at the University of Texas at the Anderson uh, Center. So in addition, John is an incredible educator. His teaching skills have been recognized with multiple awards. In 2013, he received the Pediatric Resident Faculty Teaching Award. In 2019, he was awarded the highest teaching honor in the LSU system, the Allen A. Copping Excellence in Teaching Award for Clinical Teaching. He can just as easily teach in a classroom, often with his famous chalkboard presentations. Uh, or one-on-one -on -one with a resident or a student in a patient's room in the clinic, or at bedside with a group of students and residents on rounds. With each patient encounter, he models how to be an effective, caring, and compassionate clinician. His clinical competence is remarkable. John's enthusiasm, his friendly common sense approach, and his self-deprecating humor put everyone at ease, trainees, parents, uh, patients, and even the occasional grandmother who, when you go to a subspecialty clinic appointment and have the patient, the mother, and the grandmother, you need somebody like John to lead the discussion uh, for the management of that patient. Mm. John's compassion and humanism were, re were recognized with his induction into the Gold Humanism Honor Society in 2018. I don't know how many times John has driven from Shreveport to Baton Rouge to represent Louisiana's children 
or the Louisiana chapter of the AAP, but he's done so innumerable times. He goes to uh, speak to governmental agencies. He's a member of advisory committees. He's given testimony at legislative hearings and at committee meetings, all in the interest of children and all in the interest of the providers of care, those of us who take care of children within the state. So when we talk about true leaders, we talk about people who rise to the occasion during a crisis. When COVID appeared, John was in a perfect position due to his background and training as a virologist and a clinician to understand what needed to be done to address this rapidly unfolding and constantly changing pandemic. John has led or participated in almost every aspect of our local and regional, regional response and has helped shape our state and its response. From developing strike teams to test in nursing homes, prisons, and at multiple outbreak sites, to setting up a PCR testing laboratory, a genomic sequencing laboratory, and pioneering our three stages of vaccine response, from drive-through vaccine clinics to local pop-up vaccine clinics at multiple sites, and now to supplying vaccine to individual offices, John has helped lead and organize medical community response in close collaboration with public health. There is no doubt that many people have received their information about COVID from John, as well as their vaccines because of his efforts. In addition, John has become a regular on TV and radio with almost as many TV appearances as Tony Fauci, to which I understand from one of his aunts that he trained. Um, John has provided so much education, not only to residents and students, but to his patients, their parents, and to the community. Lastly, I get to work with John almost every day. And it's been my honor and pleasure to really get to know him as a person, as a father, as a family man, as a colleague, and I'm proud to say as a good friend. So to my paisano, my heartfelt congratulations. Congratulations, John, one of our two master pediatricians this year. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, not sure what to say, but, uh, you know, I'll get my turn on you, so don't worry. <laughs> All right, I'll share my screen and um, get, us, uh, get us rolling here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there we go. Hold on. There we go. Uh, that should do it. There we go. So by my estimation, I'm halfway through uh, 25 years of pediatrics, and I'm sure hoping and looking forward to 25 more. And uh, the far left there, you can see me as a nerdy kid in, uh, in first grade. And uh, I'm still the nerdy kid, uh, but my my costume has changed a bit, and uh, and so I uh, have have moved on up. And you can see me on the far right there, to uh, wearing a hat that one of my patients gave me, and of course our our pandemic masks. So I really appreciate the honor of being named a master pediatrician. I am am humbled by the introduction and by the honor. So I thank you all very much. I'd like to share with you a little bit about my story and what drives me, uh, what motivates me. And I'll first introduce one of my patients, Landry. Landry's 18 months old when we met her. Um, bright, as you can see, uh, toddler, just in charge of the world. You know, the one who wears the diapers rules the house, the first child for her parents, and um, just a, a beautiful child. And uh, Landry presented to us with, uh, and Joe and I took care of her together with a several week history of fever and uh, enlarged lymph nodes in her neck, in her axilla, in her groin. And um, her CBC showed some lymphocytosis, uh, but no blasts. We weren't really terribly concerned about cancer and leukemia, especially. We evaluated her for all the, the scary things that we do, neuroblastoma and the like. And Landry just continued to get sicker. And 
And what we ultimately determined after biopsying nodes uh, from her thoracic cavity is that Landry had a rare uh, B-cell lymphoma, a very aggressive B-cell lymphoma uh, that was apparently kicked off by Epstein-Barr virus. And we know Epstein-Barr virus can be uh, a cancer, is a cancer-causing virus in some people. Um, but for, for Landry's case, um, uh, a very startling reminder of how insidious some of these germs can be and how the combination of some germs and, and some patients just doesn't mix well. And for Landry, um, her aggressive tumor uh, and, uh, led her to St. Jude's um, very quickly. She was treated with rituximab and other chemotherapeutic agents, relapsed very quickly within a, a less than a couple of months, she had a bone marrow um, transplant, uh, and ultimately that was, was a failure and she didn't survive. And Landry is one of those kids that, you know, as an infectious disease doctor and as, as a physician, we all have these kids that we just never forget. And they drive us. They, you know, as an academician and, a, and that nerdy pediatrician kid, they gall us because we don't have an explanation. We don't have an explanation for Landry's parents at why this particular germ that is so benign for so many people caused the death of their child. And that's the kind of case. And when I talk to students, I say, you know, case reports are still so invaluable because they show us what is at the ends of the bell curve of medicine, what is in the, in the spectrum of possibilities that we might not have thought about previously. And, and Landry's story is, is not unlike that of, of other kids that, that we deal with, especially in our academic medical centers. And I, I'm, I'm really struck by this quote by uh, an academician, Sandy Shugart, who says, hope is an inner assurance that a better future is possible, if not for me, then for someone for whom I deeply care. It's the belief that something I may be able to do could make a difference. Most of all, it's the conviction that what is happening means something. The struggle matters. The sacrifice and the sweat and the risk have value. And as, an, as a researcher and a, and a pediatric physician scientist, I changed the word hope there to research. And research is that outer mechanism. It's the outer work that we do to find a better future. And that's why research is so motivating to me as a physician scientist. So embarking on a research career is not something I recommend very lightly to anyone, uh, but there are lots of great, beautiful, wonderful things. The joy of discovery, the search for the truth, the, the absolute wonder and beauty of creation, the, the hunt for understanding, for closing a story that seems so open-ended like Landry's the magic of designing something new, whether it be an mRNA vaccine, which we're able to test in children now, or a new drug or a new therapeutic, and, and even more so the challenge of tackling difficult problems. And, and it's that um, passion for research that is, is, I think, one of the major hallmarks of my career. Here's another kind of patient that we've seen. And, and we've all seen them in, in academics. Here's a 16 year old boy with no prior comorbidities, had never been a day in the hospital. He got influenza, he then got MRSA, sepsis, and here he is, you know, lying in an ICU bed with ECMO. And again, a fatal disease, a fatal outcome for uh, a, a very previously healthy young boy, young man. And, and, you know, why influenza and staff were so terrible for this child when they are so controllable for, and, and, and easy to deal with for so many other people are the, are the kinds of questions that we ask as scientists. How can we change the status quo? And that's what drives research. It's saying the status quo is not acceptable. That's why we do research. And Annabeth. Annabeth is... Annabeth's my godchild. And my brother Paul is listening in and, and I appreciate, you know, the 
allow, him allowing me to tell her, her story when I can. Um, Annabeth at uh, about 15, 18 months of life was, had a clinical diagnosis of mitochondrial disease by a very astute, very wise neurologist. And his words to my brother and his wife were that Annabeth's life expectancy was three years. Well, you can see in the pictures that, you know, she's outlived that by far. Now Annabeth's 14 years old and she still suffers. Her mitochondrial disease is, is unrelenting, but she is the drive for research. She is the drive. And for more than 10 years, it's taken more than 10 years to find a molecular explanation for her disease. I mean, just think of all the technology we have now, you know, 100,000 strains of COVID virus that we've sequenced already, and it took 10 years to find Annabeth's probable mutation that explains her genetic disease. And it took fighting by my brother and those who advocate for folks with mitochondrial disease to have the FDA even allow kids without a genetic diagnosis to participate in clinical trials that could be life-changing for them, for those with mitochondrial diseases. It's that advocacy that they took and pushed on the FDA to say, you know what? This situation is not acceptable. The status quo for our kids is not acceptable and policy of requiring a genetic diagnosis is not reasonable for children with mitochondrial diseases. <laughs> and so this is the, you know, the, the frame of mind that I look at clinical medicine and research every day. There are great challenges to clinical research. Of course, over the decades until COVID, you know, less funding overall, we have to write grants. We've had more and more oversight and bureaucracy. Training requirements, of course, on the clinical side are increasing. We have busy clinical services in academia and teaching responsibilities. And damn, now we've got pandemics and we've got epidemics of craziness growing within the pandemics. And so these are all great challenges that have put so much research uh, on, on the back burners and, and have really stifled people finishing academic uh, fellowship programs from going into research because the challenges are, are huge. And, and one of my favorite quotes, and I've weaved a few through here, is that I'm a greater believer, a great believer in luck. And I find the harder I work, the more of it I have. And that's from Thomas Jefferson. And I, I think that's absolutely true. <laughs> you know, those of us who are working hard, like all of us working hard, we end up with a lot of good luck. So how do we overcome these challenges? You absolutely have to find your passion and share it with others. You develop a vision for the long term. You don't play the stock market for the short term and you don't do research for the short term. You gotta start small, learn a skill, apply it. Something as simple as PCR can open, open up, you know, learning about all kinds of, of things that just seem unimaginable. And, you know, we teach high school students to do PCR in our laboratories now because, because that is what will drive them to be even better and more forward thinking and smarter researchers than, than we are today. You can't expect Nobel Prizes or miracles, and you absolutely have to work collaboratively with others. Research is a, a, is a, is a, a team sport, as is clinical medicine, and, and, and more so now in, with these complex patients we're dealing with. You've got to constantly reevaluate and seek input from, from people you know and people you trust, and even from people you don't trust. Um, develop a track record in your niche area, and learn to write, do so often. One of the things that, that cripples young faculty members is their inability to write. And, and so, you know, as I see our, my youngest child who I'll introduce you to in a little while coming, you know, writing more and more in middle school, that to me is phenomenal because the skill of writing is just so critical uh, to teaching and academics. Never ever forego your ethical principles because you can't get them back. You've got to be able to look the eye, look your patients, your colleagues in the eye and, and know they know that you're trustworthy. Avoid over-interpretation, 
And of course, diversify your potential funding sources and don't be afraid like I did to, uh, don't be afraid uh, as I was successful doing to ask a bunch of cattlemen in West Texas to fund a research project for me. And they were thrilled to do so. Um, and, and that's the kind of creativity we have to get to to overcome some of these challenges. And you absolutely have to know your limits and ask for help. I listened to Dr. Goldsmith's talk this morning and gosh, you know, the last time I had a laryngoscope in my hand um, was a very long time ago. And it would be dangerous for me to have a laryngoscope in my hand. I remember it's the left hand, but you know, that's enough. Keep the light bulb on, right? So you've got to have mentors and tormentors. And this quote from Einstein sits on my desk a hundred times every day. I remind myself that my inner and outer life depend on the labors of other men and women living and dead and that I must exert myself in order to give in the same measure as I have received and am still receiving. That the work I do is, is, is built on the shoulders of my mentors and tormentors over my career and, and so many people who've come before me. And there are a lot of mentors and tormentors in my life and I've listed a good many of them here. And you know, it starts in college and in medical school and in my graduate studies at CDC and Dr. Butel, especially at, at Baylor College of Medicine in the virology. And, and it was so heartwarming. The first time I came to her, I said, you know, I've got this CBC and a child with a 22,000 white count. And if I'm going to find this virus in their white blood cells, this is the one. And she says, is 22,000 a high white count? And I said, wow, that's great. That's great. Because now I'm able to cross boundaries and work in areas where we can talk about different things and teach each other. And my colleagues at MD Anderson have taught me so much about what we can do, the limits we can push in, in, in moving the dial forward with life-saving therapies in the areas of cancer and infectious diseases. And our, our leaders in the AAP and Jimmy Guidry, of course, my pediatrician, uh, Pat Uncle, my father's best friend, um, who I met with just a couple of weeks ago to talk about, you know, where I am and what are my decisions and what am I doing? And Dr. Uncle is, is uh, even at, at an advanced age, he was the first master pediatrician for the AAP. And he still reads more infectious disease journals than I do on a daily basis. He's just amazing and sends me articles because he knows I'm missing them at this busy time. And of course, Dr. Bocchini, um, Dr. Bocchini recruited me up to Shreveport. It did take a little longer than a year uh, for, for us to finally make that happen. But my relationship with him as a mentor and a tormentor sometimes and a friend has been really phenomenal for, for this growth phase in my career over the past 14 years. So when I met Dr. Bocchini, you know, I had this small vision of the world. There were viruses and there were retroviruses, you know, and then I realized there are also retro docs that kind of look like retroviruses. And so um, I figured, you know, all right, I sort of know where I am. I know what I'm getting into. And, and uh, shortly after I moved here, we formed the Italian American Infectious Disease Society of Northwest Louisiana. And there was even a cartoon in the New York Times about us. And, and I'm the short one. Yeah, he's the tall one. Uh, and, you know, is it shoot a cold, stab a fever? We were just trying to figure out where we are. But but our specialty is taking care of your little problems with great discretion. So whenever you uh, have those issues, little germs, whatever they may be, you can call us. But we've got miles to go before we sleep. And, and it's been a, just a fantastic run with Joe over the past 14 years, working daily together, um, walking miles on Fridays and uh, on Saturday and Sunday mornings together, there's our time in a 5K right there. Yep, under an hour. We walked a 5K in under an hour. We crossed paths down there in the bottom right in the Atlanta airport in the, in the height of the Zika, Zika epidemic in South America. And, and Joe's leadership and his friendship, his mentorship for me has been really uh, just a, a tremendous part of, of the growth of my career over these past 14 years. I, I can't say enough. Um, what a privilege it is to work for him and, and with him. And, and, and when we're together, he's the attending and I'm the fellow. And that's just how it's always going to be, I think. <laughs> There's the students. The students are a phenomenal part of motivation for me. 
uh, they ask great questions. They challenge us as, as faculty. And these are two pictures from Hawaiian Shirt Friday in our micro microbiology uh, and infectious disease course, which I was uh, privileged to chair or be the course director for, for a number of years and, and really enjoy being close to the students because they keep me young as, as my own children do as well. The patients, of course, are phenomenal. Um, they're challenging. On the bottom left there is one of a little patient of mine who was adopted from Russia. And, uh, and she comes to see me every couple of years and, uh, and, and just the sweetest thing. And in the middle there is one of our patients with congenital CMV being transported in the midst of one of the floods of North Louisiana by grandpa and, and mom. And uh, Tucker was born with severe congenital CMV and, and uh, a few years after this picture died un, un, unexpectedly in the middle of the night. Uh, thought to have had a seizure. And of course, there's always the cute ones uh, who come in dressed to the nines in their Batgirl outfit or their Christmas dresses or Christmas suits for the boys and, uh, and, and are just so wonderful. And then we get gifts from our patients. And uh, I'll highlight this one um, from one of my patients who was on a long-term course of metronidazole and his parents <laughs> gave this sign to me. How do you handle metronidazole carefully because it's fragile. So even our patients develop a sense of humor about infectious diseases. Of course, the, the research nurses are a phenomenal part. And as I said, you know, clinical and basic research and clinical medicine is, is really a team effort these days and can't be successful without team efforts, team leadership. My research team has grown over time. And, and these are a lot of the folks who've been working with me over the past decade and, and you know, working with the tens, dozens of students in my laboratory, medical students, high school students, college students, really to, to understand and push boundaries on understanding of, of new concepts in medicine, new microbial factors, antibiotic resistance, uh, develop animal models of disease and the like. And of course, there are a few dinners here and there that are always enjoyable. And uh, this picture on the left is, is, is one of my favorites. In the middle there is Dr. Uncle, my pediatrician. There's Dr. Bocchini, Dr. Larry Pickering, uh, a, a famous uh, CDC and Emory uh, person, uh, Dr. Michael Bolton. Uh, he's the fellow in the group at this one, but uh, one of our friends who trained up in Shreveport and is now on the faculty down at, in Baton Rouge, Dr. Buddy Creech and uh, Dr. John Bradley there with uh, most of us with our spouses at a, at a dinner a few years ago at the AAP uh, uh, potpourri. And, and the dinners are part of my, my respite, part of you know, my joy in life is cooking and uh, occasionally woodworking. And, and, uh, and so you'll see me not infrequently over the grill here is at Thanksgiving grilling oysters. And, and uh, I love my time in the kitchen, uh, especially with, with family and friends around. Of course, travels, academic medicine prevents, presents us the opportunity for lots of travels. And um, my travels, uh, countries of, of travel are listed there. They pale in comparison to those of my children. Nobody asked me for a long time who my travel agent was when I'd only been to Romania and Botswana and South Africa. And then I added El Salvador and nobody really was interested in going where I wanted to go. But, but travel has really been amazing. And the picture there of me at Machu Picchu is, is uh, was just a phenomenal trip. And uh, these are all legitimate opportunities for training courses. I'm not taking junkets, I can assure you. Um, and, uh, but providing training to physicians in other parts of the world, doing research in other parts of the world has been a real, a real pleasure to learn about how things are done in, in different areas. And, the, and the, the beach picture down there on the bottom is in Brazil, and far down to the right is, uh, is Ipanema Beach of, uh, of musical fame. Can't talk about my story without talking a little bit about my father. And um, some of you knew my father. Uh, he was a pediatrician in Lake Charles uh, for 30 years. Um, he graduated from LSU Medical School in New Orleans in 1964. And uh, he's pictured here with my younger brother, Andrew, in the middle here. Um, like me, my father loved uh, to cook. He really um, uh, probably would have thrived very, very much in an academic environment. Um, and I appreciate you know, some of his partners who are here on, on, the, on the presentation now. Dr. Wallace, thank you for, for joining us. And 
Um, my dad's pediatric career most definitely shaped mine. I knew by the time I was in high school that I wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, and, and I learned a lot from my father about that. I learned about how a pediatrician can, can change the dynamics and, and the life path for a family in so many ways by their advocacy, by their teaching, by their uh, care for the child, by helping parents be better parents. And I realized the importance of, of advocacy in the public forum and the, po the political forum without getting sucked down uh, into, into the weeds, but, but making things right where they needed to be and not, um, and not giving up and being relentless. And, and I think one of my father's proudest moments was when the S-CHIP program was approved by Congress because of his and the LAAP's work on that effort. My mother is... Um, uh, also um, a force to be reckoned with. And um, even at, at this stage of her life, she still works full time as a nurse. She's a palliative care nurse. As in the middle picture there, you can see her teaching one of her grandchildren how to sleep. Um, in the bottom there, she's with our older daughter, Katie, at, at her white coat ceremony. And on the far right with my son, Peter, uh, when he had a trip to Lake Charles. And um, my mother has traveled with me around the world to different places, went to Romania with me uh, a couple of trips. And um, really I've, I've had the great pleasure to have my mother, you know, be my nurse in, in medical settings and, and work closely with her and learn from her about caring for people and how to demonstrate that care. You know, the, the, the things that she has modeled for me professionally have, have been very important to my development as, uh, as, a, as a physician, as well as a parent. I've got a, a, a bevy of brothers and a sister, and this is a recent gathering at my mother's house, my, my three brothers here with me. And yes, you will notice in that glass that I'm holding, it, it does say Bella Donna on it. Um, that's not a tribute to my mother, uh, whose name is Donna, but um, we have a whole set of glasses that are curare and, and the like. So, uh, but my brothers and my sister have also been great supports for me during my career, during the long years of training. And, and um, as, as we've each had our own families, we've, we've re remained close and, and always enjoy our time together. The home team, well, I could say a lot about the home team. I'll introduce you to them in the course of my, uh, my career because our family has grown over time and, and um, it's, it's just amazing and exciting to see uh, our children uh, growing up into the, the, the adults that they are meant to be, the wonderful people they are meant to be. And, and I always think of a quote from Mother Teresa who said that, you know, saying there are too many children is like saying there are too many flowers. And for me, each of our children are a different flower in a bouquet, each of which is beautiful and each so different and so wonderful. Um, Katie is our oldest. She is now a third year internal medicine resident at Temple University in Philadelphia. Her husband, Austin, um, uh, was lucky to catch her before the pandemic. They got married in October of uh, 2019. And um, we're so proud of Katie and Austin. And of course, in the bottom right there, you can see their pup, Cinnamon, uh, very proud of, of where they are, who they have become, and, and where they're headed. Julia, our second daughter, is uh, living here in Shreveport. She's uh, graduated from Louisiana Tech, and she's a full-time teacher and librarian at uh, the school, uh, St. John's Berkman School here in Shreveport. And we get to see Julia frequently, and that's it's great for all of us when Julia comes because Julia brightens the room and, and always um, helps us uh, just relax. And, and so it's great to have Julia here. I know her younger sisters especially enjoy having time with her. Caroline is our traveler. Caroline has traveled to more countries than probably all the rest of us put together. Um, and I've found this picture of Caroline and Katie on the Champs-Élysées and I'm like, wait a minute, when did they go to France? And, and it took me a while to think about it, but Caroline has traveled all over Europe, had spent a semester in, 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 in uh, Strasbourg, uh, spent a year in Spain, uh, graduated from LSU uh, with, with uh, just fantastic honors there and now is working for a, um, a corporate consulting firm in, in Houston. And so proud of, of what she's doing these days. 
Peter, our son, you know, God only puts more men where more men are needed. And after three daughters, I think he figured out I needed a little help. And uh, so Peter is now in his sophomore year at the University of Alabama. And I can say that with a straight face because they're paying for it. Okay. You all appreciate that. Peter is all boy, was from the beginning and still is. It's, it's really great to see Peter uh, maturing and, and asking questions and, and becoming uh, an adult, uh, a very exciting path forward. And you can see in the bottom picture here how fast he runs because all his hair is, is flown back because he's running so fast. Just amazing to watch him run like a gazelle. Martha is a sophomore in high school and Martha is uh, very talented in drama and uh, music. And um, you can see her picture there in the middle with her grandparents. She played her ukulele and sang for them at their 70th wedding anniversary a few years ago. Um, Martha is uh, loving high school and uh, really learning and growing into a beautiful young woman. And Maggie, the cat's meow. What can I say about Maggie? You can see in the bottom, bottom picture here, a second from the left, she has clearly an electric personality. Um, even as a baby in the top left, she bounced around in the carrier and just loved it. Maggie is, is also growing into a, a beautiful young lady who has an exciting future ahead of her. When she was five, she wanted to go to calculus camp. And of course we did. And, and when she was a little older, Maggie was, you know, we put together an aquarium for Maggie one day, the same day I was working calculus with Peter and reading EKGs with Katie. And that's the the, the joy that I have as a parent with my wonderful children. And of course, Margaret. I've toted her all over the world. Um, sometimes it took a little while to convince her that it was okay to go, but you can see her here riding in the back of an ox cart in Costa Rica. We've been to South Africa and Botswana and Margaret's been a trooper. And she is my respite. She helps me calm when I need it, rest when I need to. And um, she's my love. So lessons learned. Don't surprise your spouse, at least not too often. And if you're going to surprise them, give them a little lead time, okay? That's my best advice. Africa took a year. Life happens, so be prepared. You know, with my employees, I tell them every day, you know, there are times when you got to get your car fixed, your cat fixed, your, your teeth fixed, whatever it might come, they come for all of us. And they are just a part of our life. And we can't always be prepared for them, but we can, we can, we can be prepared to accept them. We can be prepared to deal with them when they do happen. And we can expect them to happen. And, and that's okay. Success requires a long-term plan with a broad view, and, and everybody in academics, everybody in pediatrics absolutely knows it, right? We plant seeds when our patients are children, and we watch them mature and grow into the wonderful adults they will become, and, and that is uh, the ultimate success as parents and as pediatricians. Sometimes we have to find excitement in the mundane uh, that can be very life-sustaining, and, and I know for me, my gardening time is is seems boring, but um, it, it to other people, but I absolutely love it. And and like research, gardening is an understanding of what will come, what the hope of the fruits of our labors, literally, and the vegetables of our labors. <clears throat> you'll never need uh, you'll never need to cut the umbilical cord until you realize that it may be holding you back. And I think this is one of the things that, especially in academics. It, it can be hard to realize that sometimes the environment you're in is not a fertile one, and, um, but you feel like you have to stay there for whatever reason. And, and the best decision I ever made for my career was moving to Shreveport and finding a mentor like Joe Bocchini and realizing that, yes, I could leave Texas Children's Hospital and be successful uh, in, in the environment I'm in. The recipe for success is actually dependent on the ingredients that you have, and you have to bloom where you're planted. And, and for all of us, life changes our path uh, multiple times for most of us uh, in ways we don't expect, but we do have to bloom where we're planted and, and um, really be humble about that and, and be ready to take on the challenge it might be. As I've said 
clinical research and clinical medicine or team sports. And finally, the course we ultimately take usually doesn't follow the map that we'd previously drawn. Uh, we can draw maps all day, but it is uh, only through the grace of God and the, the wonderment of our world where we may end up. None of us particularly saw this pandemic coming the way it did. Uh, there were people who predicted it, but sure not the way it has evolved and, and how it has changed our world in, in the past 18 months. Um, so my last words are hold on tight, y'all. We got rough roads ahead. Um, this fall and winter are going to be bumpy and all of you will be challenged. All of you in, in many ways in medicine and in your private lives are going to be challenged. And and we all wish it was different. We all wish we didn't have to wear masks, but uh, I go back to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's quote there, get action, seize the moment. Man was never intended to become an oyster. Oysters are for eating. And, um, and that's what we do in Louisiana. So um, with that, I say thank you to all my LAAP colleagues and dear friends who put up with me, placed their trust in me, motivated me and continue to pray for me. God bless you all. Thank you. Mark your calendars now. The 2022 Red Stick Popery will be held August 19th through 22nd in Baton Rouge at the Renaissance Hotel. As details are available, they will be posted on the conference webpage at www.laap.org 2022 popery. After viewing all of the sessions, scan the QR code or go directly to the website to complete your evaluation and claim continuing education credit. If you want to obtain MOC credit, you will need to take and pass the post-test after completing your evaluation. Please reach out if you have any questions or need additional information. Thank you again for participating in the 2021 Virtual Red River Popery.